after the psalm reading, will you please join us in singing the response? A reading from Psalm 36. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains, your justice like the great deep. O Lord, you preserve both man and beast. How priceless is your unfailing love. Both high and low men find refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. For with you is the fountain of life. I'm awake. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to Talbot Park Baptist. Still not on. We're still not on yet. Good morning. Now we're on. Hi, you're awake. <laughs> you're awake. Yes, uh, even though you lost an hour of sleep, and Karen Martin and I have a running bet to see how many folks will show up at 1145 this morning thinking that they're 15 <laughs> minutes early. But you all made it, you all made it, and we are glad to see you all here for this time of worship together. I uh, invite you to wear your mask throughout the worship service, over your nose and your mouth, even as we are singing, uh, to make sure that we stay good and safe and distance from each other. And uh, let's continue in our worship as we stand and sing at Calvary.
I would invite us as we pray together at the end to conclude with the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Loving God, you have gathered us to worship and to glorify you. The days are getting longer, the birds are singing, the flowers are beginning to bloom, and in the air there is a tangible sense of anticipation as all creation joins in praising your name. The world is a gift for us to enjoy, God. We thank you this morning for the beauty of the earth, for the coming spring, for the signs of new life in the midst of death. God, help us to be good stewards of the gift of creation. Remind us that we were originally created to tend the garden. Teach us respect, not just for our fellow humans, but also for the plants and the animals of this world. Open our eyes to that abundance that is around us. Give us the generosity of spirit to share what we have been given with others. God, in a world that often seems God forsaken, sometimes we lose sight of who you are. We become preoccupied with our own narrow interest and we fail to see the grace that you offer us. This morning we confess our lack of faith in you and we pray that we will become more attuned to the glimmers of your presence that are all around us. Break through our clouded vision and demonstrate once again the way of your kingdom, a way of truth and peace and justice. Grant us the faith to live our lives as a testament to your continuing presence in this world. Through our words and our actions, help others to see that God is not far away, but alive and working for our good. Our God, it's with gratitude that we are gathered here today because we know that for every request we have, for every burden on our hearts, there are hundreds of prayers that you've already answered. We ask you now not to do something new, but to continue what you're already doing, to bring healing and comfort in the midst of sickness and grief. Keep us mindful of the needs of those in our community, particularly those who have no one else to care for them. Strengthen us as a church family so that we will grow in joy and courage and most of all in love. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed, hallowed be, be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread, bread and, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as we, we forgive those who trespass, trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. From evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, power and, and the glory, glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen.
Scripture reading from the book of John, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. In the same way that Moses lifted the serpent in the desert so people could have something to see and then believe, it is necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up, and everyone who looks up to him, trusting and expectant, will gain a real life, eternal life. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son. And this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help, to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted Anyone who refuses to trust him has long since been under the death sentence without even knowing it. And why? Because of that person's failure to believe in the one-of-a-kind Son of God when introduced to him. This is the crisis we're in. God light streamed into the world, but men and women everywhere ran for the darkness. They went for the darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. Everyone who makes a practice of doing evil, addicted to denial and illusion, hates God light and won't come near it, fearing a painful exposure. But anyone working and living in truth and reality welcomes God light, so the work can be seen for the God work it is. The Word of God for the people of God. Let's stand and sing our praise song together.
may be seated. Our text this morning is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. And I'll begin reading in verse 1. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who was rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. The word of God for the people of God. How do you bring someone who is dead back to life? That's the question over which Dr. Victor Frankenstein obsesses, and so he decides he's going to attempt it. He goes out, he steals various body parts by robbing graves, and then he comes back to his laboratory and tries to assemble the different pieces together, and through a process of trial and error, according to the story, the good doctor eventually discovers the secret of reanimation. I always think of that classic scene from the old movie where the lightning strikes, you know, the creature stirs on the table, and Dr. Frankenstein shrieks, it's alive, it's alive. Of course, truth be told, I always preferred Mel Brooks' version of young Frankenstein. Y'all remember that one? When Igor goes out to get, and that's Igor, not Igor. Igor goes out to get body parts for the creature, and he brings back the damaged brain of Abby Normal. I always felt like uh, that might have been the brain that they used when they assembled me. But uh, bringing people who were dead back to life has fascinated humans for centuries, and it's the core of our text this morning. Paul writes that in Jesus Christ, you and I have been made alive again, which is an amazing claim. Some of us didn't realize we were dead. <laughs> and, and I think that's the first step before we can come to life. Sounds strange to say that someone might be dead and not know it, but I think that's the exact situation in which many of us find ourselves. And no, I don't mean we are zombies. Although, whenever I begin to preach, some of you take on that glassy-eyed, open mouth, slack jaw, zombie look. But when Paul tells the Ephesians in this letter that they were once dead, he's not talking about physical death, although, of course, we believe that God, through Jesus, brings us back to life from physical death, too, right? That's the promise of the resurrection. That's what we're going to celebrate on Easter in just a few weeks. But when Paul, in this letter, tells the Ephesians that they were dead, he means that they were dead in their trespasses. If the Ephesians were actually physically dead, they wouldn't be able to read this lovely letter that Paul is writing to them. And what Paul means, as he helpfully explains in verses 1 through 3, is that they were dead in sin. And I think that's something we need to spend some time unpacking this morning, because I think you and I have a hard time accepting the idea that we might actually be dead. Part of that is our very narrow understanding of sin. You and I tend to think of sin as a conscious act, something we do or something we don't do. 
It goes back to the rules that I preached on last Sunday. So uh, we think that if we're following all the rules, if we are doing the things we're supposed to do, if we're avoiding the things we're not supposed to do, then bingo, we're sin-free. But when Paul talks about sin in this passage, he understands it in a much broader sense. Paul says that the Ephesians were living according to their fleshly desires. And when I hear that phrase, fleshly desires, I immediately think of sex. Maybe that's just me, but fleshly desires is a whole lot more than sex. Fleshly desires means that they were living however they wanted to, without regard to God's kingdom. And to Paul, that was the equivalent of death because it was the opposite of the abundant life that God intends for us. Does that make sense? This is important, uh, because if being dead in our trespasses is just committing a bunch of sins, then you and I are probably going to feel pretty good about ourselves, because most of us, I'll say most of us, try to live according to the commandments. But when Paul says we are dead, what he means is that we are living in ways in which we do not experience true joy or peace. We're like that Frankenstein monster. We seem to be alive, we appear to be alive, but really we're just a collection of random body parts that's creaking along. (laughs) Paul says that when you and I live without Jesus, we might as well be dead. I think that is very hard for us to see in our modern world. And partly because our lives seem pretty sweet these days. Now, I know we all got troubles, we all got worries, and those are real. I'm not trying to diminish that this morning. But comparatively to most humans in history, you and I came along in the right time and right place. We got technology and medicine that greatly extends the length of our life. We have armies to keep us safe. We have houses to shelter us. And when we get bored, we have Netflix to amuse us. Will Willimon sums it up nicely when he writes that these days we're able to solve most of our real problems by ourselves, fairly well off, fairly well fixed, working out regularly, watching our diet. We come to church only for helpful suggestions for saving ourselves. And so the idea that we might be dead doesn't just sound strange to us, it's almost repugnant. You know, how dare anyone suggest that my life needs to be improved? We're quite comfortable, thank you very much. And most of us are quite comfortable, but I think sometimes it is that very comfort that creates the conditions for us to stay dead. For example, In the past century, we had something often referred to as the American dream, and it was this idea that if you worked hard, you played by the rules, life was going to go a certain way. Tell me if this sounds familiar to you. You go to school, then you graduate, you get a job, you get married, you get a dog, you buy a house, you have a kid, you get a better paying job, you have another kid, you buy a bigger house. You work hard, and then you retire to live the good life for the rest of your days. That was the basic dream, with a few variations here and there for 50 or 60 years in this country. And I know quite a few folks who followed that basic path. And when they got to an older age, they looked around at all the things that they had accumulated all the retirement funds, they'd done all the things that they'd been told to do to make them happy, but some of those folks said, hey, wait a minute. Yeah, I live in a big house and I've got a bunch of stuff, but my kids don't want any of it. Yes, I have all this leisure time, but I'm really bored with my hobbies. Yes, I live longer than my parents or my grandparents did, but What's the point of living longer if the last decade of my life is going to be spent sitting alone staring at a TV screen? I don't mean to be harsh this morning, but 
for many years, I think we have made the mistake of substituting quantity of life for quality of life. And now we got what we want. <laughs> we got IRAs, we got mutual funds, we got plans to live into our 90s. But has all that comfort and that consumption brought us closer to Christ? It's not just a question of whether we can live longer. It's a matter of how we live. And Paul says we can have everything that we think our heart desires. We can have everything to be completely comfortable according to our fleshly desires. And we can still be dead. That gets me thinking. It gets me thinking about whether all of the things we use to distract us, all that entertainment, all that consumption, all that materialism, isn't just a mask for how empty we feel. We get up, we go to work, go to the store, go to the doctor's office, come to church, come home, eat dinner, watch Wheel of Fortune, go to sleep. And we get up, do the same thing the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and that's fine. It's comfortable. But then I read this passage of Scripture and I realize that you and I were made for so much more than just going through the motions. So much of what you and I call the American dream is really just death in disguise. Yeah, we're, we're relatively healthy and relatively secure, but we're not really alive. Yes, we're, we're more informed, but we're not any wiser than we used to be. We're richer, but we're not any kinder than we used to be. We live longer, but we're not any happier than we used to be. In the 21st century, we have achieved great quantity of life, but we have neglected the quality of life. And if anything, COVID has kind of accelerated that trend so that in our society, the emphasis has been on how to keep people safe, right? We've got to keep people safe. And I think that's a good goal. I want to keep people safe. <laughs> but what are we keeping people safe for? One of the things you've heard me say now several times is I believe COVID is an opportunity, really, for us to reassess our priorities. And it's been a time for a lot of us to step back, think about the things we value, how much we work, and what we really need. That's why I hear these words of Paul as a message of good news. Because Paul says that those of us who are dead can be brought back to life again. And the way that happens is not through a lightning bolt on a lab table. It happens through Jesus. Paul writes that it's Christ's mercy and Christ's love that saves us from death. And again, yes, that's death uh, saving from physical death but it's also Jesus inviting us to new life in the present, saving us from the death we find ourselves in in this world. Verse 10 says, We are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. I think that's Paul's way of telling us that you and I were made for a specific purpose in it not just to live a long time, but to live with the hope and the fulfillment that comes from knowing we belong to Christ. That's what it means to be really alive. It's not just doing what we have to do to survive. It's not just satisfying ourselves according to our fleshly desires. Life, true life, is resting and delighting in the goodness of God. That doesn't mean we can't take pride in what we've accomplished in this lifetime, that we can't find pleasure in the things that we've acquired. But life is not something you and I earn. It's a gift. That is what Paul is telling us. And until we acknowledge that, until we stop trying to turn life into something we win somehow as a competition, we're going to remain dead. The paradox is that when we give up our striving, 
and we receive life as an undeserved kindness bestowed on us by Christ, then we begin to experience what Paul calls the immeasurable riches of God's grace. And let me tell you, that's what it's all about, baby. <laughs> you and I were made for something more in this world. Something more than safety and comfort. And those things aren't all bad. They just don't compare to the life we find in Jesus. That's the only life that is truly worth living. Sometimes when I've been down at Disney World, I've had the opportunity to watch the animators at work. Have y'all ever seen them doing that? It's really cool. And uh, I know some people make fun of animated movies. Well, that's just a bunch of cartoons. But to really make a Disney movie in the old school way, before the digital era, it, it required a lot of creativity. It was a complex process with thousands upon thousands of individual drawings, each one just slightly different than the one before it. But when they were put in the right order and set in motion, it told a story. I think in many ways, God works in the same way in our lives. Jesus as the master animator, coloring us in, adding feeling, emotion. And when we feel that touch, that love, we move from being a two-dimensional character on a page to actually coming to life. This is not something we do. We are what he has made us. And if we want to know how to bring someone who is dead back to life again, there's only one way. The grace of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let's pray together. God, one day we will all face you. And when that time comes, you will not be remotely concerned with how many rounds of golf we played. You will not bother to ask if we finished binge watching WandaVision. You will not want to know the amount that we had saved in securities to extend our retirement plan. God, what matters to you what matters to us in this life is the joy, the hope, the peace, and the love we find through Jesus Christ, your Son. That is real life, both here and in the life to come. That's what you came to give us, and so often we settle for something less. So often we substitute in all those other distractions. Lord, help us this morning to see the ways in which we are dead and help us to hear the good news that you have come to bring us back to life, that you continue to offer us that grace and mercy even now, even this morning. In the name of your Son, Jesus, amen. Let's stand and sing together. Let Jesus come into your heart. Oh.
I'm glad you have joined us for this time of worship. I pray that as we leave today that the folks we encounter will be able to look at us and say, they're alive, they're alive! <laughs> or at least awake. Uh, a few reminders. Uh, we continue our Zoom Wednesday nights, uh, 6.30. Uh, that link goes out on the email that Nicole sends. If for some reason you don't get that and you would like to participate, please let us know. But that's a great time for us uh, to spend some time in prayer and Bible study together. Uh, we're also continuing to collect our spring mission offering. And there are envelopes for that in your boxes, but also some extras on the table out there in the vestibule. I believe we've already almost met or exceeded our goal, which is fantastic. We're going to see how much we can raise uh, for that. And that goes to our field personnel here and around the world. And then uh, a new announcement that on Tuesday, March 30th, a uh, team from Talbot Park and Ascension is going to come together to help prepare the evening meal for the nest guest. Uh, they are meeting this year at First Presbyterian Church, so uh, they have not rotated around due to COVID, but we're going to be able to help serve a meal. And so if you're interested in helping prepare for that or serve that, let me know in the next couple of days. Uh, we're going to get a group together and go down there and do that, of course, with masks and taking precautions and all that. But we wanted to help in any way we could. So that's the Tuesday of Holy Week, Tuesday, March the 30th. And now let's stand together as we sing our benediction for this Lenten season. <laughs> 